Hey everybody, Pastor Sullivan here at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kerrville, Texas. Thanks for joining me for another episode of ATP. Ask the Pastor. You know the opening spiel. Like, share, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, check out the goodies in the video description below, yada, 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 all that. Today, somebody asks about small groups. Dear Pastor, within evangelical Christianity, cell groups are pretty popular. We're Christian lay people meet, read the Bible together, talk about it, and pray. Can such groups also play a beneficial role within confessional Lutheran congregations? And if so, can lay persons lead such groups? All right, so, so small groups go by many names, uh, whether you call them cell groups or family groups or whatever. Uh, but the definition of them is that they are groups of 6 to 12 people that meet in someone's home or someplace not the church, uh, and they read scripture, pray, and share their feelings and experiences. And the group is typically entirely lay-led. Now, it's sometimes said that small groups as we know them today have their origins in Jesus' ministry to the Twelve, and especially the early house churches of the New Testament. But neither of these examples fit the definition of small group Bible studies, small group ministries, because neither one of those examples were led by laymen, but they were led by those whom God had called to publicly preach in the church, to, to publicly teach the gospel, whether it's the Son of God himself or the ministers in the churches. Now, while it's true that the first Christians met in people's homes, they weren't meeting, uh, these meetings weren't separate from the congregation's public worship. These meetings in people's homes were the congregation's public worship gathered around the preaching and teaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments. So the house churches of the New Testament, they aren't the origin of small group ministries as we have them today. And if those weren't, then what was? Well, small groups were originally introduced into the church as part of Philip Jacob Spainer's pietistic program in the late 1600s. Spainer was a Lutheran pastor who founded these cell groups within his congregation so that lay people could mutually encourage one another to true piety, but also that they could encourage one another to a higher spiritual life uh, than they could get out of the church's regular worship service, which consists of preaching and the administration of the sacraments. Now, ministers originally led these groups at the beginning of the pietistic movement, but as pietism grew, these small groups, which were called conventicles, became increasingly lay-led. And this was due to the fact that pietism devalued an educated, called and ordained ministry in favor of leadership by those whom they viewed as truly devout and pious. So to the pietist, it wasn't the office that made the minister. It was the godliness of the person alone that made the minister. According to another Lutheran pastor writing around this time, uh, Valentin Loescher, the pietists derived their conventicles from the priesthood of all believers. He wrote, They want anyone who is suited and moved to handle the word of God as a teacher in their private assemblies. Loescher also reported that the pietists felt that the conventicles were necessary uh, in and of themselves, that they were essential means of Christianity. He wrote, The third error is that they regard the private assemblies and the statements made in them as much more holy and useful than the public teaching in the worship service. Some pietistic teachers were claiming that an unstudied word in such conventicles has much more spirit than the power of the preacher, or as he writes, uh, that if one chattered words without power for whole hours. So ultimately, Loescher decides that these conventicles, they functioned uh, as churches within churches, special congregations of the truly pious within the larger congregations. Now, it's often assumed that in our day, uh, small group studies, small group ministries, emerged uh, due to sociological rather than theological reasons. Uh, that the family and community institutions, as they weaken, 
and our culture becomes increasingly secularized and individualized, uh, people are yearning for this, this connectivity uh, of the groups. I don't think that's the sole reason or even the primary reason, though. I think churches use small groups because they don't think that God works through the preached word and the administration of the sacraments effectively, but rather that where God really works is through intimate relational experiences that happen around or, or rather alongside God's word. So small groups cater to um, the idea of theological enthusiasm, the idea that God speaks to us within our hearts uh, by our subjective experiences and our relation with others. Small groups then go on to facilitate those experiences, which are then mistaken for God's presence and God's working. Uh, the use of, our, of small groups in our day, uh, it's remarkably similar to the use of uh, that of the pietists in the 17th and 18th century. The regular worship service, uh, which focuses upon God's word and the sacraments as the means of grace, that's just judged as inadequate. Uh, Howard Snyder, who was a modern church growth practitioner, wrote, A small group of 8 to 12 people meeting regularly uh, meeting together informally in homes is the most effective structure for the com communication of the gospel in modern secular society. Uh, Carl George, another church growth enthusiast, compares the regular worship of the service of the church service to small groups, and he asks, "Where does the most life change occur? In what context do people become conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ?" Experience indicates that these transformations occur best in small groups. There, believers can experience transparency, vulnerability, listening, and the use of spiritual gifts to one another. Now, those statements were both written in the 1990s, and yet they could be placed in the mouths of the pietists from the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, again, all of this is to demonstrate that small groups move people's focus away from the divinely instituted means of grace to their own felt needs. Uh, and they confuse those felt needs with spiritual needs and then meet them thinking that the Holy Spirit then is working better and more powerfully in the play, uh, than in the places where he's actually promised to be and to work. Preaching and teaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments. Now, small group Bible studies, as the viewer mentions, are lay-led, which functionally turns the lay leader of each group into a lay pastor, male or female. Again, Carl George writes, the leader of each nurturing group functions as a lay pastor to that 10 or so person flock. He goes on to say, cell leaders may be of either gender, uh, even as the group may be single sex or mixed sexes. So put all this together, and you have part of Spainer's original pietistic program. Uh, the small group becomes a church within a church. Churches within churches with their own lay pastors. Uh, and so this group then is viewed in a quasi-sacramental sense with the expectation that God will work through it, through the relationships in it, rather than the word and sacrament ministry of the church. The methodology of small group ministries, uh, you know, it, it rejects Scripture's teaching that those who teach in the church, that those who, those who teach the saints need to be called by God through the congregation. Uh, based on Jeremiah 23 and Romans 10 and elsewhere in Scripture, Lutherans confess in our Augsburg Confession, no one should publicly teach in the church unless he be regularly called. The small group methodology also then uh, makes things like the, the, the group dynamics there, the transparency, vulnerability, listening, and the use of spiritual gifts to one another, as we heard Carl George say, it makes those the instruments through which God creates and sustains faith in people's hearts and brings forth more mature fruit of the Spirit. In contrast to all this, Scripture teaches that God calls men into the gospel ministry to do the work of the ministry, which is preaching and teaching the gospel, and administering the sacraments, because those are the means through which God delivers the benefits of Jesus to us. Uh, Christ established his ministry to feed the sheep, not to teach the sheep how to go and feed other sheep. Uh, you know, all Christians are priests, 
1 Peter 2, 9, who are to proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into, the mar- into his marvelous light. But that does not mean that all priests are ministers. And so Christians, as members of this holy priesthood, first and foremost, offer God-pleasing worship in their daily duties, uh, the various callings of their life. Now, none of this is to say uh, that Christians shouldn't be speaking with one another, uh, talking with one another about Scripture, praying with one another, encouraging one another, consoling one another with God's words. Uh, Ephesians 5.19 tells us that we're to be speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Small groups, however, create an artificial environment to do these things. Far better, in my opinion, uh, is when individual Christians who have been nurtured by God's Word in the public service of the church, in the public Bible studies of the church, speak with, pray with, comfort, and console their neighbors whom God has placed in their lives. That's the way of vocation. Interacting in Christian love and with God's word with those whom God has placed in your life, with your neighbors that God has given you. And the way of vocation is much more difficult than the way of small groups. But the way of vocation has God's command, it has his promise, and it's faithful to what he's given us in his word. So rather than join a small group, I encourage people to live in their vocation and be a neighbor using God's word to comfort those around you as he gives you opportunity. Hope that helps. We'll see you next time for another episode of ATP.